And we'll get on to uh, introductions and we'll have, we'll hear from uh, uh, John and Gary. Uh, upcoming Stegner Center events uh, next week on Thursday, October 4th, uh, we will be hosting uh, Heather Hansen, who's an award-winning reporter and author who will be speaking on her book, Wildfire on the Front Lines with Station 8, uh, same place, same time, uh, next Thursday. On November 9th, uh, the Stegner Center will host a conference uh, on PURPA at 40, uh, which addresses, uh, that's the uh, uh, Public Utility Something or Something Act, uh, that addresses renewable energy law and policy in the United States. It's an all-day conference uh, here uh, at uh, Level 6 at the College of Law. Uh, our website has a list of uh, speakers and the topics they will be addressing, and we do require registration for that all-day conference. And I also wanted to note uh, that March 21st to 22nd, the spring, will host the 24th uh, annual uh, Wallace Stegner Center Symposium. This year, uh, the topic is Recreation Challenges on Public Lands. Uh, our keynote speaker at the conference will be former Secretary of the Interior, uh, Sally Jewell. Uh, a couple of other uh, quick announcements. Uh, please uh, uh, sign up on the sign-up sheet if you haven't previously, uh, which enables us to uh, get in touch uh, about uh, upcoming uh, events. Uh, also, uh, outside, uh, the King's English Bookshop uh, is selling uh, copies of our speaker's book uh, today, uh, and both uh, John and Gary will be happy to sign uh, after uh, we're finished. Uh, let me thank uh, the Parks and Recreation Department here at the University of Utah, who has worked with the Stegner Center to enable us to bring uh, both John and Gary uh, here uh, to the university. We'd also like to thank the Cultural Vision Fund, which has provided funding both for this lecture as well as uh, other Stegner Center lectures, our annual Young Scholar Program, and our annual uh, Symposium. Uh, we are greatly indebted uh, to the Cultural Vision Fund for its ongoing support of the Stegner Center. So uh, today we will hear about the future of conservation in America, a chart for rough water. Uh, we have uh, the two authors of that uh, book, which is just recently released uh, with us. Uh, let me uh, first uh, introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Gary Macklis, who's a university professor of environmental sustainability at Clemson University and served as a former science advisor uh, to the director of the National Park Service. He's co-editor of Science, Conservation, and National Parks, which is published by the University of Chicago Press. Uh, and Gary will be followed uh, at the podium uh, by John uh, Jarvis, who served for 40 years with the National Park Service as a ranger at the beginning of his career, a biologist, superintendent, regional director, and then served as the 18th uh, director from 19, uh, from excuse me, from 2009 to 2017 of the National Park Service. He's currently the executive director of the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity at the University of California, Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming both Gary and John. Um, thank you all for coming, joining us today on an important conversation about the future of conservation in America. We're honored, John and I are honored to be here at the University of Utah, and it's so fitting to be speaking in the moot courtroom of the law school, given the contentious role of the courts in American conservation. And of course, the Stegner Center honors Wallace Stegner, who graduated from this university in 1930, went on to become, quote, the dean of Western writers. He, he laughed at that subtly dismissive title given to him by Richard Edelin, writing in the New York Times, who spelled Stegner's name wrong when he made fun of him. 
Stegner went on to win the Pulitzer Prize, and, and he insightfully understood the importance of the national parks. So thank you for having us here. Today we want to speak briefly about the future of conservation in America. Our thoughts closely follow the release of a book this spring, The Future of Conservation in America, Chart for Rough Water. For reasons that will soon become obvious, the ideas and views presented are ours alone and do not represent the University of California at Berkeley or Clemson University or in fact any other institution for that matter. They do represent our 40 years each of experience in conservation politics. We wrote the future of conservation for several reasons. We wanted to sound the alarm over the current assault by the Trump administration on conservation. We wanted to use our lessons learned to describe how this turbulent time in conservation, what we call rough water, is impacting the American landscape and how it may unfold beyond this one administration. We also wanted to provide practical strategies for action. It is not enough to be outraged or to recite a litany of environmental harm being done by the present administration. There are essential and effective strategies that can advance the cause of conservation in America in ways that are bipartisan, respectful of differences, science-informed, forward-looking, and practical. We wrote this to share those strategies and encourage their use. And finally, we wrote to declare our confidence in the resilience of American institutions, the American conservation movement, and its contribution to the nation. Make no mistake about it, conservation is a patriotic American act. So our book charts a path from alarm to action to optimism. We want to very briefly share with you those three elements and then engage necessarily and hopefully in a lively conversation with you about it. First, the alarm. The immediate assault on conservation is wide-ranging and includes Abandoning the Paris Accord on climate change, which every country in the world except the U.S. has joined now that Syria and North Korea signed on. Eliminating citizen advisory groups and removing university faculty from other advisory groups because they received funding for university research, all the while stacking these groups with industry officials removing public access to scientific data, and erasing important websites for citizens to gain information about environmental concerns, attempting to muzzle federal scientists, violating scientific integrity policies, and retaliating against those civil service professionals that resist, proposing the elimination of successful conservation collaborations that have engaged both industry and environmentalists such as the Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes initiatives, rescinding resource management policies that protect national parks, and working to reduce the size of national monuments created by both Republican and Democratic administration, including Bears Ears here in Utah, rolling back regulations that protect citizens and arm them with information, such as eliminating the requirement that fracking operations reveal the chemicals used in underground pressurization that demonstrably causes harm. Cutting funding for vital climate change research, proposing to expand accident-prone offshore deep water drilling, while at the same time proposing to lower the already low royalty payments by oil companies that are used to support local conservation through the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which has been in place in both Republican and Democratic administrations since 1964, and weakening as a prelude to gutting the core federal conservation laws, such as the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, and the Endangered Species Act, and more. These actions directly harm conservation 
and degrade protection of the nation's lands, waters, and the communities and families that depend upon them. And there is more to come. The populist movement, with its resentment of scientific experts, media, minorities, immigrants, and the federal government, will likely extend beyond this current administration. Conservation groups and university scientists and institutions like the University of Utah will continue to be included in this collection of resented interests. The politics of personal destruction, the viciousness of the alt-right that even now attacks conservatives as well as conservationists, and the turning away from building resilience into the fabric of American cities and the countryside, and the erosion of American preeminence in science will likely continue. In addition, the challenges facing conservation are even more structural and long-term. In the book we write, regardless of political party, narrow self-interest, or even well-intentioned actions, there are major environmental and social threats that confront America. They form the underlying causes that frame our immediate conservation problems. Three of these threats can be observed as interdependent examples, we write. Climate change, species extinction, and economic inequality. There is, for example, a direct line between climate change and economic disadvantage in this country, with poorer counties and poorer neighborhoods confronting more hazardous futures than wealthy ones. Coastal cities are in the vanguard of harm. The immensity of Hurricane Florence's recent impact has introduced whole new vocabulary, new kinds of numbers that we've never heard before. 18 trillion gallons of rain from one storm. What does that mean? It's enough to cover Texas. <laughs> in, in four inches of rain. Relatively, it would cover Utah in a foot of rain, to which some of you might add, we could use that kind of rain. But the, the, that's a statistic, 18 trillion gallons. But behind that statistic is human suffering, is real human suffering. In the absence of preventative actions, by 2035, and there are some young people here who will still be vigorous in 2035, by 2035, nearly 170 coastal communities will reach what is called chronic inundation, flooding on average every other week. These communities will face profound decisions and hard alternatives of defending against the sea, accommodating rising water, or retreating from flood-prone areas. For conservation to navigate these rough waters, there is a need to have both an immediate and a long view to respond to the current threats and the underlying causes and to act with what we describe as strategic intention, which is a fancy way of saying act, but act smart. Strategic act intention means that an action for conservation is not just useful in its own right, starting an urban gardening program or protecting a wetland or electing a conservationist to city office, but is an act that furthers and leads to further progress. We describe in the book this principle and provide examples. Importantly, we suggest a very different understanding of what conservation means and what it can accomplish. Our experience suggests that the conservation movement must greatly expand its base, and we call for a unified vision that binds together nature protection, historical preservation, business sustainability, public health, civil rights and social justice, and science all into common cause. This is not the siloed conservation of the recent past. Too often portions of the conservation movement struggle among themselves for priority, for funding, 
for membership and more. We quote Ben Franklin and remind conservationists they must either hang together or they will surely hang separately. We write in the book that there will be a time when the physician, the pastor, the park ranger, the business leader, the scientist, and the school teacher, all working together for conservation, will not seem unusual, but expected. This is of critical strategic importance and suggests new and broader alliances for conservation will be necessary. When civil rights and social justice and nature conservation and historic preservation and health and sustainability and science come together, real progress is possible. Now I'd like to turn it over to John. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Gary, um, and thanks, Bob, uh, for hosting, and, um, and thank you for all you've done in conservation uh, with your extraordinary career. It's great to be in Utah, um, home of the Mighty Five, some uh, amazing national parks and some extraordinary public lands that uh, belong to, to all of you. You know, Gary and I have done this talk now, either together or separately, over 20 times. And um, every time I hear the line, the physician, the pastor, the park ranger, the business leader, the scientist, and the school teacher, I imagine them walking into a bar. Uh, but I, I haven't come up with the punchline for that yet, so uh, you, know, you can work on that for me. Um, it is, though, during my tenure as the director, there have been times when sort of these unusual coalitions come together. And sometimes it is in a local dive bar or, or some piece of common ground where they find a, a, a way to work together uh, towards common goals, particularly in conservation. And I think that at the core of our central message is that in these, these uh, troubled waters, these rough waters as we've identified, <clears throat> we have to have the long view and we have to have new coalitions and new cooperation in order to achieve that. And we have to have what Gary called strategic intention. This was a, a key principle in the centennial of the National Park Service that we executed uh, up to and through 2016. And it was the strategic intent in that effort was specifically to connect with and create the next generation of park advocates and visitors and supporters with a, with a target market of the millennials, the 18 to 35 year olds. And as a result, I would say we've seen a rise in resistance uh, to uh, the efforts to undermine conservation and, and attacks on our parks and public lands uh, as well, particularly from the millennials. And so you can, you can also rest assured that that was one of our strategic intentions in the centennial is to build this new constituency as out there as well. Now there, is, there are some downsides to that kind of intent of building new constituency. The parks are, let's say, a little bit overwhelmed uh, with visitors out there this day, but in many ways I'll take that over apathy or indifference any day as well. In our book we outline 14 strategies, very specific strategies uh, for conservation, and I'm not going to go over all of them. You can, you can read them in the book, but I am going to hit a few just to, just to highlight. <clears throat> and I would say that some of these strategies have been employed sometimes by some groups, um, but we call for them to be applied in a much more systematically, uh, system, systematic way across uh, the entire landscape. <clears throat> so just a few, for instance. Um, I think one of the areas that Gary and I uh, agree a lot on is how, uh, how little the general public really understands science and understands um, the scientific process. Um, and as a result, they throw doubt on a lot of the conclusions. And we really believe that the next generation of scientists need to be better communicators uh, to the general public. I, uh, as mentioned, I'm working at the University of California, Berkeley, and I just met with a group of science students. They're undergrads pursuing careers in science, and I suggested they add a class in poetry or journalism or, or something so that they can, can learn to write, not only for the scientific journals, but also for the general public as well. And we think conservation communication needs to come not just from conservationists, but from 
popular writers and filmmakers and corporate executives and mayors, governors, doctors, and religious leaders as well all need to be carrying the conservation message because they all have, we all have a stake in the future of the planet. We also need to focus a lot more on connecting with rural communities. Um, as, as all of you know, with the populist movement uh, that we are living with today, a lot of it is coming out of the rural America. We have, have felt that they have been left behind. And yet, in my own experience, um, working at Crater to the Moon or <clears throat> working in rural Idaho, is there is still uh, a wellspring of conservation uh, advocacy and ethics in rural America. It just often is ignored or completely untapped uh, by the conservation community. There's one really good example that, that Gary and I know well was the establishment of the Katahdin Woods and Waters a National Monument in Maine. And that, that had a lot of uh, local opposition. And um, the son of Roxanne Quinby, the founder of Burt's Bees, a, a really extraordinary young man named Lucas Sinclair, um, decided to have uh, to meet with absolutely everyone uh, in that region uh, and what he called a thousand cups of coffee um, that uh, if you were uh, adamantly opposed to the designation of this new national monument in Maine, uh, odds are that he was going to knock on your door at some point and ask to come in and sit down and listen. Um, and I think that that key kind of listening to rural communities is really, really going to be important in the future of conservation as well. We also need to listen to communities of color that where there is there's often a disparity and a lack of equity and access to, to green spaces um, across the country. Uh, and this is an opportunity for uh, to create uh, those threshold experiences in conservation early in, in a child's life. The, uh, recent shift by the Trust for Public Land, uh, one of our premier conservation organizations out there, to really include urban parks as a priority in their conservation effort is a, is a great example of a shift uh, in focus from, uh, from just the traditional protection of wilderness areas as well. We also need to sort of expand what we call the American story to all Americans so they, they feel part of, uh, of our nation's history. Let me read you just a, a section that Gary and I put in here in the book. Every aspect of American history has more than one story, more than one perspective. The Americas were not discovered by Columbus, as there were millions of pre-1492 inhabitants with elaborate language, art, architecture, music, religion, and trade. Westward expansion ultimately connected the West to mid-continent and East Coast into a continent-scale country but decimated the existing nations of Native Americans. The Emancipation Proclamation granted freedom to four million African Americans, but they still had to fight for another 100 years to achieve legally protected civil rights. Hispanic heroes fought in the Civil War. Suffragettes chained themselves to the White House fence, and Japanese Americans fought bravely in World War II, even as their families were incarcerated in camps back home. So to perhaps start to rectify that. With strong and often bipartisan community support, President Obama established new national monuments that represent these untold stories. Cesar E. Chavez, Harriet Tubman, Pullman, Belmont Paul Women's Equality, Bears Ears, Fort Monroe, First State, Hana Uli Uli, Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers, Stonewall, Reconstruction, Freedom Riders, and Birmingham Civil Rights. These sites contribute to a more complete history of America, and by placing them alongside the Lincoln Memorial, Gettysburg, and the Grand Canyon, help engage citizens who may feel distanced from the traditional and narrower American narrative. We also think, and Gary mentioned this briefly, is that in the spirit of Emily's list, we need to encourage conservationists to run for political office, and we need to give them the, the tools they need to win. And we need to challenge the older conservation veterans, like ourselves, to promote a, an intergenerational handoff of power and responsibility to the emerging younger conservation leaders, because it really is their future that is at, at stake as well. We shouldn't forget that in many ways conservation was led 
and civil rights were led by young people. Congressman John Lewis was only 25 when he marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge over 50 years ago for, for the right to vote. <clears throat> and we call for a much more coordinated landscape scale approach to conservation as well. I think that we clearly understand that our models of protecting individual sort of islands is probably not viable anymore. Just this month, a colleague of mine, uh, UC Berkeley, uh, Dr. Patrick Gonzalez, published his analysis of climate changes in all 417 units of the national park system. And his report shows that our national parks are disproportionately affected by anthropogenic climate change, in part because they're already located in environmental extremes. So we now know that the even our largest parks, and I was the superintendent of Wrangell St. Elias at 13 million acres, are not intact uh, and that are already being affected. And so we have to start thinking and operating at the landscape scale. And then most importantly is that con the conservation movement needs to really expand its base, really spread out and bring in uh, the new uh, components, whether it's historic preservation or public health, the civil rights and environmental justice movement, uh, and the business community. Uh, often we sort of forget about the business community and their potential. Um, certainly all of you know about the outdoor retail industry uh, pulling out of Utah and moving to Colorado and sort of flexing their uh, conservation uh, muscles as well. When I was director, we were able to convince the U.S. government's uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis to actually generate a report, uh, which they just came out with, uh, on the contribution of the outdoor industry to the American economy. And um, they just reported that, that the outdoor recreation is 2% of the GDP. Um, that's $373 billion annually into the U.S. economy, which is more than all of oil and gas and mining combined. Um, and then just this week up here in uh, Park City, there's a group of business leaders and entrepreneurs and investors uh, that are gathering uh, to put business uh, skills and business acumen to solving some of the environmental problems around the world um, while also making a profit at the same time. So uh, I think that this is, a, this is a new area that we need to pay a lot of attention to as well. And as we're going to be talking tomorrow, there is an emerging field of the relationship of health uh, to nature as well. And we are uh, developing great uh, partnerships with the medical community and the public health community to, to assert this as well, as well. There are challenges ahead. There's no question about that. And uh, we, we concluded our, our last chapter as the title of resilience. And we come back to this theme of strategic action and optimism as well. And we know that a determined and, you know, sort of more unified conservation movement uh, can navigate this rough water, uh, but make some really sustained advances as well. I'll read you just one more little piece here. We have faith in and admiration for the next generation of conservationists and what they can and will accomplish. They inherit a world fraught with peril and a nation divided, but their inheritance also includes access to global knowledge, commitment to improving their communities, and self-awareness that they can and should empower themselves. Finally, we are optimistic because we have seen firsthand the restorative powers of nature. If provided the opportunity and sometimes assisted by human insight and skill, nature can flourish and recover. We have seen the high meadows on the flanks of Mount Rainier return from bare ground to an eruption of alpine flowers. We have seen the flows of water, flows of water critical to what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas called the river of grass to be replenished in the Everglades of Florida. And salmon once again swim the Elwha River from the sea to the mountains in the Pacific Northwest. We have seen community gardens bursting with vegetables in formerly vacant lots of Chicago and Baltimore. And the renewal of beaches and tropical forests on the island of Vieques that was once strafed, bombed, cratered, and littered with munitions. And it is not just nature that re can recover and flourish. So can our history, our sense of justice, and our respect for civil rights. 
As Gary said, ultimately we believe conservation is an act of patriotism. And we ground that in our belief in the resilience of our national values, our institutions, and the American people. And as I mentioned, Gary and I have been taking this book on the road. <clears throat> we are uh, done 20, 24 something universities uh, with a public lecture, um, particularly because we believe in uh, reaching a new and younger leadership in the conservation movement. And we are expressing optimism uh, to that community. And it is their turn to step up. Uh, and we will also be listening uh, to what they say about it as well. <clears throat> we end this book with a, with a story, a story that has uh, deep personal um, connections to me. It's the story of a, an oyster farm in Point Reyes National Seashore. And if you look across all the different conservation battles uh, that uh, have been held over many, many years. This one has probably got every possible element uh, that you can imagine. It had paid lobbyists uh, that were uh, there for the, the politics of personal destruction on uh, all of the federal employees involved. Uh, there was a very divided community uh, that uh, was just split right down the middle over this issue. Uh, there were conservationists and conservation writ large pitted against sustainable farming. Um, there was good science being attacked by scientists. Um, um, there were court battles, uh, great legal framework all the way up uh, to the Supreme Court and then remanded back to the lower courts. There were investigations by the Inspector General and, and uh, uh, other organizations. And there was good old fashioned bare knuckle politics in Washington, in the White House, and on the floor of the Senate, and in the Department of Interior. Uh, but through strategic intention and, and a lot of really, really great people, uh, conservation ultimately won that battle. Um, and the oyster farm and three million pounds of debris left uh, in this estuary were removed uh, from the only marine wilderness on the Pacific coast in 2016. And so we end with just a, a very positive little note here. In 2016, the year of the centennial and the election, on one of those low sandbars of Drake's Estero, a harbor seal hauled out with her pup. For the first time in almost 100 years, a harbor seal sunned undisturbed by motorboats run by oyster farmers. She does not know why it's so quiet, but we do. Thank you. So, <clears throat> Gary, <clears throat> we're going to invite Gary up, and uh, we are happy to take your questions. That's not a mic. <laughs> um, and we'll, I'll give all the hard ones to Gary, and, um, and, uh, but we're wide open to uh, what you have to say. There are mics down here so that everybody can hear your question uh, or comment, and um, we'll take it from there. Yes, sir. Could you uh, both explain your respective uh, ideas on the relationship between preservation and conservation? Do they overlap or is there a tension? <clears throat> <laughs> I have put um, much less truck into taxonomy of words since the eight years we spent working <laughs> in politics. Um, and that for the conservation movement, it is a trap to get into, in my opinion, to spend too much time parsing out what these words mean as opposed to saying what you intend to do, the strategic intention. So I, wouldn't, I, w I guess I would say I don't see it as a big deal between them. I know that historic preservation has to deal with issues different than conservation, for example, of uh, fisheries. But if the conservation movement spends too much time parsing out words, all that time is not spent acting. That would be my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I'll add to though, you know, um, we have spent a lot of time in our careers sort of arguing over these words and what they mean, particularly as you go back to the original statutes to conserve. Uh, I always think it's interesting that the conservatives of American politics use the same root word, uh, and you would think they would be stronger supporters and have actually historically been much stronger supporters 
of conservation as well. I think in my mind, um, the where we are headed and where we have evolved is that we, I think today, see humans as a much more uh, integrated component of conservation than in the past where the concept of preservation was somewhat eliminating the human aspect. That's preservation in the natural, in the natural world, not historic preservation uh, as I see it. And I think the modern definition as we have tried to define in conservation is that we are incorporating the human element in that as well. Someone else? Mm. No, come on. Um, young people, the young folk, yeah. one, one moment, the young folk, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you can just shout it out if you don't want to get up. I'm going to tell my story. Yes. Okay, I, this, uh, I have to tell you the story. So um, in 2016, I was uh, at a conference called Inspiring the Next Generation, right? And I was getting a plaque or something for doing that. Um, and um, and uh, it was your classic room full of, you know, the old, white, predominantly male uh, conservation community. And back in the corner was this small group of young people fairly diverse. And, uh, and this young woman uh, came up to me and uh, uh, she said, Director Jarvis, um, my generation is, um, appreciates what you're doing to inspire us. But what are you doing to empower those of us who are already inspired? And then she leaned in and she said, you need to let go. <laughs> and, and that is why we're on our farewell tour. <laughs> and she said, but we don't want you to walk away. She said, we want you to lead an intergenerational handoff of power. And that is exactly what Gary and I are attempting to do. And um, so that, I think, is the key uh, to, uh, to this next phase. So. <laughs> I, my training is partly as a sociologist. We call that administrative die-off. <laughs> you, ju you just wait till they're gone. Um, but you also can you also can do this. Um, act with intention. You've only got so much time in your busy life. Make sure that the conservation actions you do lead to future conservation actions. If the established organizations don't feel that you're ready to lead, then leave them and start your own. Bingo. America is a land of tinkerers. And if you l opened your wallets and saw how many organizations you belong to and how you change, there was a time when the Sierra Club was just beginning. There was a time when the Natural Resources Defense Fund was just beginning. If they're the old guard and won't let go, ignore them and go on your own. And then there are two other things young people need to understand are core to conservation. Two more. They are not recycling your cardboard. And <laughs> they are not riding your bicycle. The two most important things you can do are vote and bring someone else to vote. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think, you know, one of the efforts that we were trying to do when I was director was to nurture these new young groups. Uh, and uh, whether it was Outdoor Afro or Latino Outdoors or uh, there's uh, um, the Rainbow Hikers, you know, which is an LGBT group. And I mean, just any new organization that is emerging and wants to sort of make a difference and, and, and gather young people together for the benefit of conservation, we wanted to help get them started. And I think that that's... Uh, we're seeing signs that the classic conservation groups are, are starting to do that a little bit, but not quite yet. Uh, I think they're still sort of caught up in, in, the, 
and protecting their bit of their turf. And I, I think uh, Gary's spot on. So good luck with that. Yeah. Yep. That's correct. Yeah. So um, the question, if you didn't hear it, was what are we doing in California to reach the young people uh, and uh, get uh, an inspiration around that? And I had lunch with Alice just uh, about a month ago to uh, talk a lot about her work. Um, so part of my institute uh, at the University of California, the Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity, is we have the California Outdoor Engagement Coalition. And we have 150 organizations that are working together for collective impact, specifically around, uh, well, in part in communities of color, but it's around connecting people to nature, particularly kids. And we partner with the Children in Nature Network. Um, we have some specific cities that we're working on. And it's about, um, and this is down in the California weeds here, I'm sorry, but they just passed a, a proposition uh, the four and a half billion dollars for parks in California, of which 750 million is going to park deficient communities. Uh, so specifically to create green space within uh, within communities that do not have it now. Uh, <clears throat> and then the next step, of course, is getting program to provide that opportunity, whether it's community gardens, it's environmental education program, it's it's uh, nature walks, it's public health. Uh, which is another big part of it as well. So there's there's a lot going on in this space right now. And you know my own lessons with creating the Every Kid in a Park Pass uh, know that we we need to really start young kids with contact with nature early in their in their lives, and then have multiple touch points, a ladder of engagement as we called it, so that they might have that first experience very young, another one in in elementary, one in middle, one in high school, and then. It's not that they're all going to turn out to be park rangers, but they might have a value set uh, around conservation. My question kind of picks up from Pat's question on the preservation versus conservation concept. And I, I wonder if, if one strategy going forward is, is to, we've already kind of almost abandon the preservation concept because, as you pointed out, it doesn't include you know, people so much. And are we at the point where we want to try to redefine conservation to make it more palatable to the masses, in particular, maybe separating almost the science out of it? Because science today seems to be coming almost a dirty word with some circles. And for example, you know, I see the strategy of folks like the Sierra Club working on climate change, just dropping the issue of if it's man-made, but the, bringing it to the issue of we need, you know, clean air and like a different strategy. And then another um, point I wanted to make is the, the debate that like Peter Kariva started, that we need to abandon the concept of preserving these natural communities in their present or historic state because they don't exist anymore with the exotics that are everywhere that we can't get rid of and communities reorganizing because of climate change. So if we redefine conservation to be more palatable, will we cause rifts between our current environmental movement and even scientists? Does that make sense where I'm getting at? It's a good question. You asked if it makes sense. No. <laughs> but let me explain why. Um, the time is, this is not the time to make conservation palatable by separating out its foundation, which is good sound science. Instead, it is to make conservation patriotic and important by integrating that science and doing it, as John said, in ways that communicate. There was a hearing that John had early in his tenure in Congress about climate change. He was one of those testifying. I was sitting behind him as his book. You know, like he could turn to me and say, <laughs> tell me something, and I would try to do that. But the most important witness was not the director of the Park Service. It was not the PhD science advisor. 
It was a mayor, a Republican mayor, a mayor of a local gateway community who said, in the preservation of this park is the preservation of my community. It is through maintaining the integrity of this park that the young people in my community will have jobs and stay there. And after all, isn't that the life of a community, right? So I believe, number one, we do, we, we do not try to make it palatable. When, when you start to excise words, like we don't want to say human cause climate change even though it's so, you are simply doing their dirty business for them. And instead, it has to be brought, why does this matter? So what? Every farmer in South Carolina, and now after Hurricane Florence, every coastal community understands that climate change will affect everything from their food supply to their insurance costs. So we have to go the other direction and make it a foundation for it. The place you are correct, however, is that it is not always the scientist that is the best spokesperson and that we need to you we need to have other voices being heard as far as peter's um silly idea <laughs> for a, a rambunctious garden where you <clears throat> give up on nature and tinker with it if all, if, if you could do one thing to try to understand the fundamental flaw of his assumptions, just watch any of the Jurassic Park movies. <laughs> they never end well. They never end well. And to have the hubris to deny that nature has complexities we don't yet understand is a dark road you don't want to go to. Instead, we need to... Un Science understands a lot of it, but not all of it, and more discovery is needed. But I will say this, for, he is well-intentioned. He's just wrong. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, yeah, I'll add a, a couple two cents to that uh, discussion uh, as well. I think that <clears throat> um, in the world community of parks and protected areas, the word protected area uh, we recognize as a problem because it is interpreted as protected from uh, the people. And we also know that around the world uh, with parks and equivalent reserves that the local communities probably have more potential impact and actual real impact on the biodiversity conservation and the, and the success of those areas than anybody else. In any, whether there's philanthropy coming from the United States or government uh, control or whatever, it's really the local communities. And figuring out how to integrate <clears throat> their core lifestyle and values with the protected area, with the park, <clears throat> is key to its long-term sustainability. So, you know, back to our point about landscape conservation, you know, my sort of big vision is that not the rambunctious garden, but a, a landscape that is, has an element of design to it, where the, the traditional park with its large natural resources and its, in its, uh, its core of of biodiversity is, a, is an anchor uh, within this larger landscape that has connected corridors that connected to other landscapes. But mixed in with that are communities and people and transportation corridors and, and you know, green spaces for local communities and uh, you know, mitigation areas for climate change and, and all of that integrated in, a, in some coherent way that is sustainable politically sustainable financially and sustainable ecologically as well. And I think we are on the verge of sort of understanding that. We certainly have the technical and perhaps even the scientific capabilities to design it. We don't yet have the governance. We don't really understand yet how to sort of assemble that in a way that, that it is sustainable. And I think that to me is the next iteration uh, of conservation across the, the landscape. Do we have time for one more? Okay. We, we need to leave room for you to go buy books. <laughs> <laughs> right here. I, I think it's a, you know, a very interesting idea, um, optimism and pessimism. And uh, we're headed in. And uh, <coughs> sometimes I wonder about the tension between sounding the alarm, recognizing that we are in crisis, and, uh, um, for example, you know, CO2. Uh, now we just 
blast up to 400 and, and there doesn't seem to be an end sight. Uh, the given the use of the automobile uh, takes up, you know, you just look at, we haven't started to move away from heating buildings uh, generally. Um, law school may be an exception. I think they did a good job of uh, building three an entire number. But uh, this, uh, so I guess I'm kind of interested in what you, uh, where the basis of your optimism uh, comes from. Um, some, <laughs> and I, I would say, uh, you know, for, for me personally, some of my optimism uh, starts to return when the President of the United States is spouting some of these crazy ideas in my opinion, and the world laughs at him. And uh, I, heard, I heard the report that uh, people do not laugh at leaders. The UN is the most respectful body in the world, most, one of the most diplomatic bodies in the world. But uh, it, seems like, it seems like this act has started to wear thin. Um, and we'll find out in the midterms, I guess. You ask where our optimism comes from. Um, I want to read you a small passage. We ground this belief in a firm faith in our national values, institutions, the conservation movement, and the American people. All the American people. There are sound reasons for this long view. There are deep American values that even now bind us together. Americans harbor a need to be respected as individuals and for their families to have futures equal to or better than what the present can provide. They expect to have their lives matter, to not be forgotten or abused by their government, and to have a voice within their community and civil society. Americans live in vastly different locales from urban to rural and tropical to Arctic conditions. But most Americans share a deep sense of place, that the landscape they live in is an important part of their lives. Ranchers in West Texas, urbanites in West Seattle, and factory workers in West Virginia can all speak with fervent care and sometimes love for their portion of the American landscape. So if you ask where the foundation is for our optimism, it's faith in national values, the importance of sense of place to all of us, and love. Yeah, I would add, I would add too that um, I think Gary and I in our careers, both of us over 40 years, have seen uh, you know, a lot of change. Uh, and we've been involved in a lot of conservation battles. And we've won a lot of conservation battles. I mean, uh, the removal of the dams on the Elwha River in Olympic National Park, 30 years of my career I worked on that, that issue. Those dams are down. Salmon are now migrating 70 miles uh, into the park, into pristine waters. And, uh, and it's restored uh, not only uh, that's, that species and that fish and that river system and all the biodiversity that comes with it, but the coastal environment and the, the, the founding site of the Lower Clallam tribe, which is, we're so uh, uh, linked uh, in tradition to that area as well. And so a, a landscape can be transformed uh, with, the, with the right work. Um, as for this administration, you know, Gary and I, of course, are very concerned. Uh, the good news is they're relatively incompetent. Um, and, and so, um, uh, and, uh, and, and they're not following a lot of standard procedures and they're going to get caught up in the courts. And it's great to be here uh, in this great law school that probably knows a lot of that. Uh, they are being challenged uh, and will be continued to be challenged on everything that they're doing. I mean, the rewriting and reinterpretation of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that you have to, you're not guilty of, of, uh, of killing a bird unless you intended to kill it. Oh, let's, you know, give me a break. That's not going to stand up in the, in the courts uh, as well. So, uh, in, in to a certain degree, you know, I, I go back to, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King, the, you know, the arc of the universe bends towards justice. And I think our role is to bend that thing down just a little bit more uh, uh, that, uh, uh, and pull down on that arc a little bit to, to maybe speed up a little bit of the process. Someone else? Yes, sir. 
There's that. Yeah, yeah I just saw that. Um, I forgot about I it. I noticed that they just uh, took the, uh, whatever you call it, up the grizzly bears, so now they're not hunting them in Wyoming and Idaho. They get which to is, hunt them. They never did get to hunt them. Yeah, they, they, well, they had their licenses. They, they paid plenty for But also, you know, I, I noticed that uh, everybody, you know, Donald Trump, of course, we don't, everybody, nobody, hope nobody here believes in him, but uh, he's, I wish there. they were. Wait a <laughs> sec. I wish they were, because we won't really make advance till we actually listen to what's driving that resentment. Yeah. My biggest fear is that we will push aside and say, well, if you don't agree with us, or if you agree with them, then we don't want to hear you. So you're but saying we're, be we're going to become apathetic? Anyway, uh, he's always saying how much the coal miners, you know, he's trying to save all these coal miners. And here we are polluting the atmosphere with coal. How many coal miners are there compared to the recreation? The thing that you were just saying a minute ago, I, don't, I think you should say it again and again. You know, recreation counts for more than oil and gas and, and mining all put together. And, and, it, and it's getting more so. I mean, look, it's Zion Park, you know, he's down there. Zinke was down there yesterday trying to figure out how many billions of dollars they've got to spend to... To bring it up to snuff, but yet we'll spend 10 billion or however much this new space thing is going to cost us, you know, plus health care. I mean, I could go on and on, but I don't know how many coal miners there are, but there's nowhere near as many coal miners as there are almost any other I industry. So it's just crazy. And it, you know, like I said, I hope, well, I guess I, we're hoping that they listen so that they go, Ugh, I don't want that. <laughs> but other than that, you know, so do you know the figures on how many coal miners there are compared to how many recreation? I've heard seen the figure figures, one. but I don't, I don't know them on the top of my head. There, it is quite small. Before, it but is, I don't know. Yeah, it is quite I heard it was like 8,000, but there's got to be more than that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks. I appreciate it. I think that the, the key to your comment in particular is that, and it's an old adage a friend of mine used to say, is that whoever makes the economic argument first wins. And uh, we have been inarticulate in the, in the, communica in the conservation world about economics. Uh, often they're, I mean, the retail industry has been putting out economic reports for a long time, uh, but they've been sort of thrown, that oh, you're just, you know, you made the, up those numbers. That's why we wanted the Bureau of Economic Analysis to do the result, do this. And that's what's really powerful about this recent report. They're the ones that put out all of the GDP work on every industry in the nation, and it is considered the benchmark. Uh, upon which they measure the economic impact in the nation. And, had, and outdoor uh, recreation had never been pulled out uh, as a separate report. And so, uh, of course, we had to pay for it, uh, but, at, uh, but we got together all the land management agencies and the outdoor recreation industry to really uh, come together to get this report out. And I think if we continue to market that information and get it out there, that how important outdoor recreation that depends upon our parks and public lands uh, for the vast majority of that, um, maybe we can start turning this in a different direction. And all the, the millions and millions of jobs that, that, are, that can't be exported. Um, and, and Gary made a really important point about this particular thing that, about outdoor recreation is that it, it's, it, it's not controlled by a conglomerate. I mean, it's, it's small business uh, across the nation. And new business is happening all the time. So it has enormous power. Um, we just need to be, uh, to be telling that story more. Up in the back. I completely agree that we need to be more, but I think that a frustration that a lot of people face here in Utah is that it's hard to get past the very beginning of a conversation because words like environmentalist or conservation are dirty words here. And so I'm curious what either of you gentlemen would recommend for those of us who want to be starting those conversations and having those conversations with the rural community or here the political majority. How do we get over the, that hurdle of these words that are so triggering? That, that's a really good question. John gave you the answer in his earlier remarks. It involves a thousand cups of coffee. Because the first step is not to worry about your words and talking to them, but to listen to what they have to say. That's why I jumped you on the coal miners, is that 
conservation in America, if it's going to grow beyond the populist resentment, we have to listen to them. What are they fighting for? I grew up as an Idahoan, and I know how little ranching on public lands matters economically, but I know how much it mattered in terms of lifestyle and values and sense of place. So I believe here in Utah, the first step is the conservation movement needs to go on a listening tour and go exactly to where the people who don't agree with you are and listen what's important to them. I gave you one example. Almost every person in a rural community, in rural America, a family, a mom and dad, worries about is the only way their child going to be successful is to permanently leave and never come home. That's not a sustainable community. And so trying to find out what is important to them, you might be quite surprised that their sense of place, their interest in sustainability can create some common ground. First listen, drink coffee, ponder, and then work. <laughs> T. No. Now, well, see, see, I can just see it now. You're in some small West Virginia community, and you're at the place where everybody gathers at 5 a.m. for their coffee, and you say, could I have some jasmine organic? You've got to give stuff up. If you want to win, drink their stuff. Respect their stuff. Pardon me? That's right. Yeah. Whoa. See? I've been in South Carolina. Then have a glass of milk, whatever it takes. Yeah. I'm glad that we're talking about strategic intention in terms of beverages. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think, um, you know, my experience, Gary spot on, is that listening, uh, you know, actively, of course, and then figuring out what it is maybe you can do to help them achieve their goals. I think has always been, has worked for me uh, in working in rural America and in, in the bush of Alaska. Um, you know, I, I mean, I worked at Wrangell St. Elias, and so, you know, Wrangell's was a, 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 a much like uh, Yukon Charlie, was the hotbed of anti-government uh, in the early days. The, uh, if you worked for the Park Service, you couldn't buy gas or eat in the restaurants. They wouldn't serve you. Um, they burned down the ranger station. They dynamited our park airplane. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, there were, you know, bumper stickers and death threats. And uh, there was a guy uh, at my office. He, he lived sort of across the street and down the road just a little bit. He sit in a lawn chair with a high-powered rifle, and he, as you drove by, he would, you know, point his gun at, at us as we drove by every day. Um, <laughs> he never shot us. <laughs> um, and... Uh, <clears throat> I figured as the superintendent, you know, if they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me. So I might as well just go into any of these establishments and, uh, and, uh, and listen and talk to these, these folks and, uh, and figure out what it is that they wanted, what it is that they, they needed in their community. Uh, and, and over time, we were able to turn that around, uh, basically by helping them achieve their goals. Uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes it was simple things, is that they didn't want all these people coming here because there's no bathrooms. You know, we don't want them coming to our, our establishment in the public using our bathrooms. So I built a bathroom for the public out in the community. And that cost me 10 grand. And it, it probably won more friends than 10 years of other efforts was putting in that one pit toilet uh, in the community. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think that is find the common ground first, then expand it. And probably not starting out with you know, we all care about the environment. You've all been very patient. <laughs> we um, appreciate you spending this time with us. We thank University of Utah and the law school for inviting us. <clears throat> we're going to be doing a few more talks for students and others um, while we're here. The copies of the book are for sale. They're very inexpensive. <laughs> buy two or three. Um, and, buy for your friends. <laughs> buy for your friends. Um, we'd be glad to sign them for you. And again, to the young people here, we're counting on you. Don't mess up. You're here. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you.
thanks again, and remember Thursday, uh, wildfire. Next Thursday. <laughs>